I'm Roger Penrose, a professor of mathematics and a cosmologist. I've spent over 60 years examining some of the most complex scientific questions that govern our existence. My research into the nature of black holes led Stephen Hawking and me to a new way of thinking about the Big Bang. In my work, I've often found that scientific concepts can be best expressed in concise images, and I'm always drawing and doodling. But one man has explored mathematical ideas in a particularly wonderful and elegant visual way. His work has been used by mathematicians, physicists, and many other scientists to encapsulate their ideas and to inspire others. But he was not a mathematician or a scientist. He was an artist. Maurits Cornelis Escher. Escher's graphic prints are instantly recognizable. They've had a profound impact on popular culture, art and film, where his creations have inspired vertigo-inducing set designs and mind-bending imagery. Beyond the world of film and popular entertainment, Escher's art has also captured the imagination of scientists and mathematicians. I first encountered Escher's work in 1954 when attending a mass conference in Amsterdam. I happened upon an exhibition by an artist I'd never heard of before, and I was completely captivated by prints of fantastical worlds with rules similar to our own, but which played with the boundaries of what might be possible. What I didn't know then was the part that I would have to play in Escher's own creative life and he in mine. This film is that story. This year, Escher's art is being celebrated in a major retrospective that starts at the Scottish National Gallery of Modern Art in Edinburgh, before going on to London. Remarkably, it's the first ever show of its kind to be held in the UK, and it's also been many, many years since I have seen such an incredible collection of his original prints all together like this. I think that the picture that stuck in my mind most from the Amsterdam exhibition was this one called Relativity. You see that locally it's made up out of structures which are perfectly familiar things like staircases, windows and so on. But as a whole, there's something strange about it. You see here someone coming out of the cellar with a coal sack and his floor is this here, which is the wall to this other fellow over here. They seem to have different ideas of the direction of gravity. Another example of this is shown in this staircase. You see, there are two individuals going in the same direction, but one of them is going down the stairs and the other one up the stairs on the same staircase. So here we have three different directions of gravity, all in the same space, three different worlds, if you like, all depicted at once. Now, the thing about this picture here is, although it doesn't make any sense physically, that is to say you've got gravity all over the place, nevertheless, you could build it. It's geometrically possible. So I came away thinking, could I design something which was geometrically impossible? Back in England, I started experimenting with ideas for impossible objects. My father, Lionel Penrose, who, as well as being a mathematical geneticist, loved inventing things, pitched in. He built models which looked as though they might just be real. My cousin Anthony was just a boy at the time, but remembers watching us at work in the woodshed. It's no mean feat, but recently he's had a go at reconstructing them. And my God, you made these. That's fantastic. Yes, well, I couldn't help remembering <laughs> you and your dad making wonderful things in the garden shed. After the Escher exhibition in Amsterdam in 1954, I came away thinking I wanted to draw something not quite of the kind that I saw mm. in the exhibition, but which, which was geometrically impossible, but you could draw a picture of it. And so I fiddled around with all sorts of things, with railway bridges and yeah. rivers and so on. And then I came round to what I thought was the sort of purest form of, of the illusion, which is, I think I can try and draw it here. Maybe not very well, but I'll try. And a little bit of shading. That's perfect, it. yes. It gives an impression of something three-dimensional, which is the 
Well, it, it certainly does, but when you try and turn <laughs> it into three dimensions, you That's get right. this. It's just a completely nonsensical jumble of bars, isn't it? <laughs> but the trick is, if you rotate it and you get it to exactly the right spot, it suddenly clicks into shape, doesn't it? Indeed. And then, of course, it's really wonderful because you can do things like that, which, of course, is, again, you, another you impossibility. You shouldn't be able to do, yes, that's right. Yes. My, my dad, Roland Penrose, Lionel's brother, was fascinated by this, and he, on a visit to Picasso, made a drawing of the triangle and showed it to Picasso. Picasso was fascinated by the, by the drawing, so much so that he said that you and Lionel should have been cubists <laughs> because... That way, you could have understood where you could have demonstrated the finding of the fourth dimension, and that was something that was absolutely fascinating for him. We're coming from him. That's a, a real, a real compliment. What what happened after that? Well, you see, after I produced this picture, and, yeah. and I remember people feeling rather ill when they looked at it, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and then my father Lionel um, decided to try all sorts of impossible buildings and things, mm. and. Uh, he eventually came up with the, the staircase. He drew the staircase, which was steps went all the way around, going down one way and going up all the way around the other way. And I had a go at that, too. <laughs> well, yes. of course, you see, it only works from when you're viewing it about where I'm standing. Yeah. Or if you look on it, I, does, I can does get it work it. for I you? Can, yes. Oh, absolutely. I can get Again, it it's here. a one eye only job. Well, one eye of mine yeah. works better than the other. So and I you can, can then <laughs> plod all the way round up the stairs yep. incessantly. Can't it, looks, it looks just right. And there were multiple versions of the stairway, weren't there? And I had a go at another one, working from a photograph that yes, your dad took. Yes, yes. And the dogs are the original dogs. <laughs> that's it, amazing, isn't it? But there's a wonderful trick of perspective in here, isn't that's it? That's right, that's right. Because if you look at this little dog and compare him in size to this one, this guy's nearly twice the size. Well, if you put your eye in the right spot, this dog and that dog we look just the same size. Yeah. So that's a, that's a paradox. It's brilliant. It's so convincing. And that makes it the perfect impossible object. My father and I published our ideas in the British Journal of Psychology in 1958. We called our designs impossible objects, describing how our interest had been sparked by Escher's art. And that was that. Until two years later, when we received a letter. Dear Mr. L.S. Penrose and Mr. R. Penrose, a Dutch friend of mine sent me some months ago a prototype of your article. Your continuous flights of stairs were completely new to me, and I was so impressed by the idea that it inspired me recently to a new print, which I should like to send you as a homage. Yours sincerely, M.C. Escher. My father passed down that wonderful print to me. It's now being looked after in the archives of the Ashmolean Museum in Oxford. Okay, well here we are, and this is ascending and descending. It's a wonderful picture. You see here we have the staircase, which is completely brought to life by these monks going around it one way and the other, and they seem to be going nowhere. In fact, Escher regarded this as a representation of life in a way, that it's just endless and goes on and on. Does it mean anything? And we have different characters also here. It's quite entertaining in many ways. You see, look, this one is evidently bemused by these monks going around here, whereas this one is totally bored by the whole thing. So it's uh, an amazing, completely accurate and beautifully detailed and realistic, yet impossible. And a dedication is to be found on this. You see, it says, as homage to Professor Ellis Penrose, inventor of the continuous staircase. Now that's a wonderful dedication, I feel. Incredible. Escher's ascending and descending became one of his most famous images. It catapulted my father's illusion from the pages of academia into the realm of popular culture, where it has continued to amaze and inspire. Most recently, film director Christopher Nolan has recreated the staircase on a truly epic scale. In a dream you can cheat architecture into impossible shapes. That lets you create closed loops like the Penrose Steps, the Infinite Staircase. See? Paradox. While my father inspired the iconic stairs, I also have a small claim to fame. 
Just a year after ascending and descending, Escher cleverly incorporated the impossible triangle that I had sketched into a new print. Yet again, he transformed a visual illusion into an extraordinarily compelling work of art. Ah, here we have waterfall. And you see, Escher has used the triangles, three different versions of the impossible triangle in this picture. He's making use of the flow of the water. It's going down all the way here, and it can run the mill in an impossible way. It just keeps on going forever. And we have people around. There are amazing plants here, which I've never seen before, and rather extraordinary polyhedra sitting at the top. Escher once said that this triangle gave him no peace, and I think I can see why. Escher was a restless genius, but his art didn't start out fantastical. Born in Holland in 1898, he trained as a graphic artist in Harlem. Much of the early years of his artistic life was spent travelling in southern Europe, where he obsessively sketched the landscape and honed his skill making prints. So where is this extraordinary looking place? This is in Bonifacio, in the southern tip of Corsica. He loved going to extreme places, often places you could only get to on foot or with a donkey. And we've got photographs that Escher took at the time he was there. And you can see that it's not a, a photographic likeness. He was always stage managing his uh, images. Mm. So he's brought the, uh, the, the back plane forward. And you can see that he's completely distorted things. The perspective is more radical. Yeah. He's put in a road here, which you wouldn't normally see from his sure. viewpoint. He's uh, invented, I think, all this bushland here. And he's made this more craggy and more extraordinary than it really is. As Escher's career developed, his work increasingly began to test the conventional bounds of naturalism. By the mid-1930s, Escher's inspiration was coming not from observed reality, but from inside his own imagination. So here, Roger, I think you see Escher's imagination really breaking free in an extraordinary way. Well, it is amazing. It starts off like a still life, and then suddenly it becomes a street. It's, it's extraordinary, isn't it? You can't see where the still life ends and where the street begins. But having an imagination, which Escher obviously did in spades, is one thing. Yeah. But it's having the technique mm. to be able to back up that imagination that Escher's really got. I think that's Look right. Look at this. Look at these cards here, the beautiful white... Uh, number five cards and the way it's reflected in this uh, bowl here just to get all those exactly right so it's not quite the same sort of depth of clarity there and the texture of this pot somehow is revealed in the way in which he's done the reflection it's all done yeah. through cutting with an engraving tool or a knife of some sort so mm -hmm. then you'll see a better woodcut than that while some of Escher's early work depicted recognisable if disorienting landscapes, he was also deeply drawn to abstraction and complex patterns. And this one looks a bit more like the kind of thing that Escher became famous for later. It is, uh, but it's actually quite an early work. It was done in 1922, but it's done in the Alhambra, in the great Moorish palace in sure. Granada in Spain. Yeah. And what he's done is seen a tile or a set of tiles, these Islamic tiles, it's actually about a metre square, and he's made a, an incredibly detailed study of it. Can you see all the tiny little details, all the graphic beauty of this? Yes, indeed. Incredibly precise. But it was only after his second trip to the Alhambra in 1936 that he became obsessed with this kind of geometric Islamic tiling. But I think you see here, even in this earlier work, the precision, the clarity, the geometry, the maths, in fact, uh, which would become the leitmotif of his later work, where you see this sort of form turning into animals and tessellations. Sure. Yes. This is where you see it first. Escher made sketch upon sketch of tiles in the Alhambra. Soon he was drawing grids over them and working out how he could make his own symmetrical patterns using repeated geometrical figures. He called this regular division of the plane, and it became his great obsession. Escher's fascination deepened when he saw an article written by a mathematician showing the 17 different plane symmetry groups used by scientists studying crystal structures. It was a helpful starting point, but standard shapes alone were never going to satisfy Escher. He invented his own creatures, playing with how he could fit them together to display symmetry. Soon his regular divisions were teeming with birds, fish, butterflies, dragons, anything that caught his imagination. Well, here we have a wonderful 
copy of a, an Escher image which illustrates a tessellation of angels and devils. It's one of my favorites and very clever. He does many things with this particular collection of individuals. And notice that this angel here reflects over into that one or it reflects about itself that way. It also has a fourfold symmetry if I take the corner of its wing, one, two, three, four. So you have twofold symmetries and fourfold symmetries, and you also have translational motions. That means a symmetry which doesn't involve any rotation. So you can move it without rotation from here to here. Now these symmetries, all of them, will extend to the entire pattern. So think about the rotational symmetry about the wing. Now if you take that point and rotate the whole picture through 90 degrees, it goes into itself. Or you can take the reflection symmetry of this angel into itself. That line there is a line of symmetry. The entire pattern goes into itself if you simply reflect it in that line. Well, you could, of course, illustrate these symmetries in terms of pure geometrical shapes. But Escher, I think, has done this in a much more playful way in terms of creatures, which is appealing to many people and even to mathematicians. I think many of them prefer to see it this way. It's wonderful, I think. Escher's regular divisions were indeed catching the eye of mathematicians and scientists. By the 1960s, his symmetries were being used to illustrate books and articles. They were the perfect teaching tool, but more than that, his use of color even drew attention to types of symmetry that had never been properly explored before. Especially in the study of crystals, which, with beautiful circularity, was the field that had fueled his curiosity in the first place. Despite having no scientific training, Escher was invited to deliver lectures in England and America about his own intuitive approach. Escher's work has since been found to encapsulate a whole host of other mathematical concepts and theories. But he never saw himself as a mathematician. He wrote, I never got a pass mark in math. The funny thing is, I seem to latch on to mathematical theories without realizing what's happening. And just imagine, mathematicians now use my prints to illustrate their books. Fancy me consorting with all these learned folk, unaware of the fact that I'm ignorant about the whole thing. It's perhaps even more remarkable that he was naturally drawn to ideas that preoccupied mathematicians, exploring them in his own intuitive way. One of the things that always fascinated me about Escher's work is his representation of infinity. Infinity plays a big role in many things that I do, such as in cosmology. And here we have a picture in which he has a pattern of hexagons which recedes or gets smaller and smaller until infinity is represented by the infinite crowding at the central point. There's another feature here where you have this very geometrical structure in the middle with these hexagons. And as you work your way out in the picture, these geometrical structures become living creatures. Something Escher was always playing with, this life coming out of inanimate geometry, if you like. And I think that was a great feature in what Escher did. Escher was hooked by the challenge of depicting infinity, but he was frustrated with cramming his shapes into one single point. Fresh inspiration came from one of my fellow mathematicians, Donald Coxeter, who had visited the same exhibition in Amsterdam that had excited me. Coxeter sent him a mathematical diagram which represented infinity not as a central point, but as a circular boundary. It sparked off Escher's curious mind. He made his own version, but not without transforming the shapes first. This is Escher's first attempt at bringing Coxeter's rather cold geometrical picture to life. And you see that he illustrates this with fish of various kinds and the infinite world of the fish is completely represented in this picture. In fact, the way the fish are, are drawn is incredible. If you go right near the edge, you can see they're very, very accurately portrayed right the way down to the very edge, which is even better than you see in Cox's picture. The triangles sort of give up a little bit close to the edge, but Escher doesn't give up. He keeps going. For me, it's a wonderful picture. I've used it to illustrate infinity in my books, 
but for Escher, it didn't have the elegance he was accustomed to. He kept on playing, and when he introduced colour, the results were astounding. And here we have Escher's third go at representing this kind of geometry. You see that he's now used colour, and the fish of any particular colour follow each other along these white lines, which are to be thought of as straight lines in the geometry that the fish inhabit. Now you see infinity is represented here as this boundary, and Escher's picture goes very, very precisely right down to the edge. The mathematician Coxeter, who gave Escher the idea of this kind of representation of this geometry, commented that Escher got it absolutely right, right down to the millimeter. It's an amazing thing that someone without any mathematical training had this instinctive understanding of what was going on in the geometry, and he portrayed it so absolutely precisely. Among mathematicians, Escher's circle limit series remains the best known and most popular visual representation of infinity. It made him a kind of household name in the field. A couple of years after our correspondence, I finally got a chance to meet the man. While I was traveling in Holland, I was invited to Escher's house in the small town of Barn, where he had been making all his prints by hand since the Second World War. I visited Escher in 1962, and he had a pile of prints on his table, and he said, you can choose one of these. I was quite stunned by that, but I went through the whole lot and picked this one out, Fish and Scales, which I was very impressed by. And Escher also seemed to be impressed that I chose this one because he said most people don't appreciate it. Now the point about this one is we see here is a big fish. There's its eye, its tail, and its scales, as you follow the picture up, they become fish swimming, well the black ones are swimming in the opposite direction to the big fish here. As they get further along to the left, they get bigger and bigger and bigger, and one of them becomes this fish here. But then you see its scales, when you follow down the picture, they become fish as well, and the black ones are now swimming this way, and one of them becomes the original fish. So it's a kind of paradox. This one's scales become that fish, and this fish's scales become this fish. So it's an endless cycle, going round and round indefinitely. The idea of a continuing cycle of time is something which has played a big role in ideas that I've been playing with recently in cosmology. So it's intriguing that these ideas somehow are so related to these concepts that Escher played with and exhibited so dramatically in his art. But mathematics and science wasn't the only field where Escher was having an impact. In the 1960s, his mind-bending world seemed to chime perfectly with the sensibility of the growing counterculture. Hippies became obsessed, rock stars used his work on their album covers. In 1969, Mick Jagger inquired if Escher would allow him to use a print on an upcoming album, sending an informal note addressed to Maurits. Escher was not impressed by the tone. He wrote, Please tell Mr. Jagger I am not Maurits to him, but very sincerely, M.C. Escher. Whether Escher liked it or not, he was being championed as the godfather of psychedelic art. This is an article on Escher in the magazine Rolling Stone in about 1970, comparing Escher's work with psychedelic art. Listen to this quote. The main reason for the sudden run on Escher is the close parallel of his vision to the themes of contemporary psychedelic art. Now, Escher had marked this and put a big question mark next to it. So clearly it meant nothing to him. It was something he, he didn't relate to in any way. And indeed, his, his own view of things was very different. Ever since the 60s, Escher's imagery has remained ubiquitous in popular culture, just as it has in mathematics, though he never courted success in either. Strangely, he's often been overlooked by the art world, although surely there are few who have combined technical mastery with extraordinary imagination in such a compelling way. Back in 1962, when I visited Escher at his home, I left him a challenge which I hoped would intrigue him. A wooden puzzle I invented with several identical pieces which I told him would tile a plain surface 
but in only one unique way. You know, I left them with him and after a, a while he wrote to me with the solution, expressing a bit of surprise that it was the only solution. Well, I wrote back to Escher and explained the principle on which these tiles were based. And the principle is basically that it's a rhombus shape where each edge of the rhombus is modified in a, the same way, either in or out, in a, according to a special rule as you go around. Escher wrote back to me, transforming the tile into a strange creature. He called it his little ghost. In 1971, he used it in a painting which followed the pattern of the puzzle I had set him. And this is the Escher's picture of his little ghosts. It turned out that it was the last tessellation watercolour that he ever produced. Finding shapes that tile the plane in interesting ways is something that's fascinated me for many years, just as it did Escher, of course. My favourite version of my tiling has been used for the paving just outside the new mathematics department at Oxford University. Now, in the, about 1974, I found a couple of shapes which, when matched appropriately, would only tile the plane in a way which never repeats itself. In fact, we see an example of that here, where you have these two rhombus shapes, the fat one and the thin one. Each fat one is marked with these stainless steel strips in the same way, each thin one also in the same way. And the thing you have to do is to match the strips so that they're continuous. Now, if you do that, it is possible to tile the entire plane without any mismatches. That would be true no matter how big the region was, provided it could be continued to infinity, which is a rather remarkable feature. Escher would have done wonderful things with these tiles. He would have created beetles, birds, reptiles, what have you. Unfortunately, he just died a couple of years too soon. It intrigues me to think of what Escher would have made of some recent advances in mathematics yet he will always occupy a special place in the history of my field. Escher played down his own understanding of maths, yet his intuitive renderings of scientific concepts is, I think, something to be celebrated, along with his extraordinary imaginative and technical achievements as an artist, which are so often overlooked. With the cyclic regularity that I hope Escher would have appreciated, I myself keep returning to his images when exploring new ideas. And it is that insatiable curiosity for finding solutions to problems which might at first be thought of as impossible that is perhaps his most important legacy.